happy Mother's Day. And we are excited about the fact that it's Mother's Day. It seems weird that we would continue a series called That Guy on Mother's Day, okay? But if you'll just give me a few moments, we, we're just going to make it a, we're going to help broaden our understanding today as we talk about um, this aspect of work in our lives. Um, we fear, this is the biggest fear we have. We fear that in most of our situations in corporate world and things like that, that if we bring our faith and it intersects with our work, that in order for that to actually happen, we have to become that guy or that girl. Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about when I say that guy or girl. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nod your head, yes? Okay, that guy or girl. Okay, this is, these are the people that just, they uber-spiritualize everything, like, you know, lunch, and they, you know, they think, you know, they, they got to bless the water before they give it to you. You know what I'm trying to say? They, they really have, and they, this is my best description of them. They bring about all the time this sense of, of spiritualization that you can be talking about simple things at work and then when they step into the conversation it's kind of a you hear like in your background like wah, 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 you know it's like it's like the Debbie Downer moment for Christians you know and all of a sudden they turn it and they want to turn to a spiritual God. it's almost like children that interrupt you you know because they're afraid they're going to forget what they're going to say you know you ever made children stop and they forget well that it's almost like that it's almost like they have to they have to keep the spiritual tone there in their life and in your office space and in your face and in your space or they'll forget or they maybe this bad company will you know have influence on me well we really we know that that's a fear for most people and maybe you won't be that person but you worry a little bit about what you be perceived as even as that person and i i think that's just a valid thing and i think that god has a lot to say about what we do, about what we, how we work and what we do. And I mean, literally, what we do 80, 90% of our time. I think God has a lot to say about that, and I think he has an opinion about that. And I believe that God is not fearful of what it looks like for you and I to live out our faith in what we do. And so we've been using this verse uh, throughout the series. We'll do it again today, Colossians 3, 23. This is from a guy named Paul. Um, he stated it this way. He started talking about slaves, and he ends talking about masters, and, and this verse shows up in between, okay, because none of us are slaves or masters in here. You might think you're a slave or a master, but you're not. Everybody kind of falls in between, and this is what he says. Whatever you do, okay, that's whatever it may be, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ that you're actually serving, or you can put the word in there, it's the Lord Christ and what you're actually doing for, okay? And so this idea comes around in this verse that says God really does care about what you do, okay? You might have trouble caring about what you do, but God cares about what you're doing. And the other part of this verse says you're going to do it with all your heart, you're going to give it your all because it's, it's, it's like, it's as if you're working for him, as if you're working for Christ, not for Steve or Bob, or if you're self-employed, not for your clients, not for the people whose, you know, whose, whose house you're repairing or car you're fixing, right? It's, it, you are working and doing all that you can do for God. And that's where your reward comes from. And that's, as we're going to find out today, where your satisfaction comes. And so we believe that he has a lot to say about work, but not just what we do. We believe that God has a lot to say about how we do what we do. Because how we do what we do matters in the grand scheme to God in our lives. How we do what we do in this life matters. So we talked about character a couple weeks ago, what a life of character looks like in your workplace. And so we talked about this idea that, that people need to see it lived out. They need to see that you've, you've placed God as, as the priority in your life and in your values. They need to see that way before they need to hear it from you. Do you guys get that? They need to see it lived out in you and your work way before they need to hear about it from, your, from, from, from that guy. And last week, uh, Zach brought us a great message about the quality of work, that quality matters. Matter of fact, he used the message paraphrase of the Colossians uh, verses. And here's what the message paraphrase says at the end in 325. It says, the sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Okay? I'm going to read that again. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Here's the reason that we, we kind of went across this last week. You can be as honest as the day is long. You can sit there in your job and say, well, I don't lie to anybody. That's true, but you suck at your job. Okay? And that matters. How you do what you do matters. So we talked about that. We talked about quality. Uh, Zach gave the five Ps last week. Now, how many tried any of the one of the Ps last week? Prayer, be present, positive, uh, prepared, because I wasn't prepared for this, uh, uh, what's the last one, Zach? 
passionate, passionate, you know? There's five pieces. These are the ways in which we can bring quality back into our work, because it does matter. And today I want to talk about another aspect of this that we struggle through, and that is value. How do we place value on what we do? And this, this is going to be the broad spectrum of today, because what we do is what, we're do, what we do in front of us is called, called by God to do. It doesn't matter if it's your job, or you're a stay-at-home mom, or you're a you know, a, a part-time worker, you're a stay-at-home dad. And I, I know f- quite a few of those. The point is, those are the things that we're doing. We're spending our lives doing that. What do you do in terms of how do you measure the value of what you do in terms of your work? Now, value, just as a definition, is the importance, the worth, or the usefulness of something. How do you measure the importance of what you do? How do you measure the usefulness or worth of it? Now, here's the problem that we get stuck before we go any further. This is a very difficult thing to do because then it requires us to have something to measure by. You know, what, what measuring stick, what tool are we going to use to measure the quality of work, the, the importance of what we do, the usefulness of what we do? That's very difficult because I believe our world has a certain standard or depending on your industry or what you do has a different standard. And so this is the two things I came back with when I just thought through how difficult it is to to, to figure out how we're going to measure value. Because these two things happen. One is that oftentimes we put too much value on what we do. We put too much value on being the boss, on being a mom, on being the CEO, you know, and it's the guy, and the guys have this, you know, well, what do you do? Well, you know, I'm the president of so-and-so, and I sell many things in large, and I, I'm kind of a big deal. I mean, you know, this is kind of one of those things where when we place value on those things, it's difficult. I see it with men a lot where, where we just, it's hard because here's the two things that happen. We place too much value on it. We either strive so hard to get there, okay, so no, no promotion, no opportunity is large enough because we have this end line, this finish line, this sort of value on top of the position, the title, the identity, so we're, we're not enjoying our lives while we're striving to get there. Or, this is what also happens, we've had it in our life and we lost that job. Or we lost that company or we bent bankrupt or we got demoted. And I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than when I've counseled men who struggle with pride and identity because they've placed so much value on their work, on what they were doing, on their title, on their position that they struggle because they, they, they feel like everything else is just worthless or not as important or not as useful. I know many women who struggle with Mother's Day because of the, the women in their life, the value they've placed on being a mom. The fact that they've placed value, this value on being a mom, that's the greatest thing that God could ever possibly do through you. And because of infertility and because of age and because of maybe decisions they've made in their life, they're not going to be. And they struggle with days like this because there's so much value being placed on it that they struggle to find their usefulness and their value and their importance. Another area that we struggle is, is not just too much value on it because really what we're going to talk about the key today is not finding value on those things, but in those things, in the things that we do. And yet so many of us struggle. We also struggle to find to see the value in our work in our mundane task, in one more diaper to change. So what if the kid smells? You know what I'm trying to say? Like in one more report, in one more thing to be copied or paper clipped or faxed. Do we even fax anymore? No, scanned, right? Scan an email. We find, we sometimes struggle to find even the value in what we're doing because it feels so much just a drudgery in life and that, you know, work doesn't seem to bring any value. So, and you don't, you personally struggle with, you know, how, how is this even important? Where's the eternal significance of what I'm doing? And so because it's Mom, Mother's Day, we, we decided to ask some moms to share with our church and share with our church family. I asked some single moms and stay-at-home moms and full-time working moms and entrepreneurial moms. I asked a few to come together and just share the answer to some questions that we, we, we find ourselves in when we struggle to find the value in our lives. I just want to share a few of these with you. Let's listen for a minute. I am a mom, um, a single mom of three children. I sometimes will struggle with the balance of 
you know, working weekends or working a job that demands a lot because I've always been in management. So it required a lot. The hours might be long or I might still be working when I get home. So struggling to find that value, it's a constant thing. And I know God ha has me there for a certain reason. You know, I'm not making a lot of money, but I'm still happy because I can still do the things that God called me to do. I can still be there for my children. I know that every day when I go in, it's an opportunity to minister to the patients. Another church, not Journey, not even in the Lake Norman area, I went to a Mother's Day service and the pastor preached about how important quantity of time was with kids and that quality of time was sort of a, a fallacy of our culture mm. and it destroyed me. I, you know, I had to go back to work the next day working 45, 50 hours a week. Feeling like I'm playing with Monopoly money. So I'm already having trouble finding the value in my work, but yet feeling passionately mm. that I'm supposed to be a lawyer. It's all I've wanted to be since I was 13 years old. And trying to figure out what the eternal significance was in that calling and how to balance that with being a mom. One thing that's important that's coming out of my job is she sees that there are options, mm. that she can work full time or she can stay at home like my best friend does. You know, that, that, that both are equally valuable and valid and she doesn't have to feel less than as a mom, no matter what she chooses. But when we moved here, I decided that instead of going back and look, seeking out another job, I would take a little bit of time off and I'd actually offered to work um, uh, do some contracting work with the company that I'd worked for, the hospital system I worked for in Ohio. So I cut back my hours and I started doing basically consulting from home. I realized that I um, had so valued the rewards that came with working in an office and the praise and the affirmation. When I was suddenly at home and the vast majority of my time, I'm a mom to an infant. My Caroline was one at the time. And um, so she's not giving a whole lot of positive feedback. And I just remember talking to Brian about it that, man, what is this? There is just something that is so unsatisfying. And I guess I just didn't realize how much satisfaction I was receiving in my job. Hmm. And that, you know, my significance was coming strong, you know, so heavily from my job and from my work. And then when I didn't have that, I, I had to really reassess. That was a moment that was a real eye-opening experience for me. I am able to see the value of how my work affects other people. Um, not always immediately, but pretty close to. And when I go to work, I get a ton of that, that feedback and mm -hmm. I feel so valuable and then I come home. And there's, there's something that happens there when you switch and you walk in that door um, and you do, you start to question if your work outside of the house is as valuable to the other people in your home as it is to you. But if I lean on myself and think, am I valuable? Is what I'm doing valuable? Probably the answer is going to be no. But am I bringing God to other people? Am I bringing God to my kids? Is there value in what God is doing through me? 100%, absolutely. I'm a stay-at-home mom, full-time stay-at-home mom, um, homemaker, now homeschool mom. So I feel like you know it's, it's easy to see the value in what I do. Um, what I feel like I struggle with is remembering that God values it. When I take the time to stop and see that what I'm doing is valuable by God, then it's a much better day. So my struggle is mainly, did I keep my eyes on God? and Did I see that I remember that today what I did was valuable to Him? I don't know where you find yourself in the midst of that, but the reality is, is that we've all had struggles finding value in what we do. No matter what that doing is and we're in our work and what we've been called to. Um, and I love the fact that they were willing to share. We were only able to catch a little bit of that and share with you this morning. But we got a lot more info from them just in terms of how does it, even as them as moms and working moms and stay-at-home moms, how they have struggled to see and connect the value. Even when we remember the value, to remember to remember the value of, of what we do. Um, one of the things that we, I wanted to dive into, Zach, last week, when he was talking about the quality work, he introduced our church to a character in the Old Testament named Solomon. Solomon was the king of the Israelite nation. He was 
King David's son. I uh, wasn't supposed to be king. He wasn't next in line, but that's how God wanted it to be. And Solomon was given the gift of wisdom by God. He was the wisest man outside of Jesus Christ that ever lived. I would love to be known for something like that, the wisest man who ever lived. And that's, that was his title, and he was phenomenal. He wrote um, uh, some Proverbs, some Proverbs of wisdom, collected them in a book of Proverbs with some other people's writings, Proverbs as well. He also wrote a book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes, which is a great book about wisdom and folly. It's a book about wisdom and foolishness. It's so cool to read because he oftentimes will bounce it back and forth. And in the first few chapters of Ecclesiastes, he addresses this issue. He addresses this idea of the value of work. So if you have your Bible, it's Ecclesiastes 2. We're going to start in verse 18. I'll have it on the monitor for those online as well. Ecclesiastes 2, 18 starts this way. Solomon says, I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I've earned. Who can tell whether my successor will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I've gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. I mean, this is, this is Solomon arguing with Dave Ramsey, you know, right now saying, I, I know we were supposed to put away and do our thing, but you know what? I'm str- I mean, Solomon had more than you'll ever have. He gained more than you'll ever gain. He achieved more than we'll ever achieve. And at the end, or sometime towards the end, he says, I'm struggling with understanding the value. Because I thought the value was on what I did and maybe on the finish line, but I'm struggling to find the value when the finish line is nothing because we're all going to die and then I don't even control the fool, which is probably your kid or somebody else who knows that buys your company. I don't even control the fool that's going to have what's left. So he gave up and he says, I'm really really just kind of despair about this. A little bit later on in verse 22, he kind of questions it again. He kind of hits the home where we are when we struggle to find value. In verse 22, it says this. So what do people get in this life right now for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with, what's the words? Pain and grief. Say it with me. Pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. I mean, that's, listen, if you've had trouble in this life finding value in what you're spending all your time doing, you know what it is to have pain and grief. You know what it is to have a restless mind where you cannot even rest because you struggle to connect the dots with how you're to enjoy your life and how you're supposed to work and all the things that you're doing. And and if you're even a Christian, you're trying to find the significance of it and how God values that as well. He goes on to say this. So I decided that there's nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find, what's the word? Satisfaction. Say it one more time. Satisfaction in work. I decided there's nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who please him. Solomon gets to the end and says, look, I know that you're focused so much on what you're doing or maybe what you think you're supposed to be doing or the value on your things, I'm telling you that I focused on that as well and found despair and pain and grief. And when I actually came to the conclusion, I came to the conclusion that I am to eat and drink and find satisfaction in what he's called me to do, in my work, in what I do. That's where my satisfaction, that's where my fullness That's where it comes, because who can enjoy anything apart from God? He gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who are doing and are connecting the dots with him. I want you to think about Proverbs, another another one of uh, Solomon's books. He collected Proverbs from other people. Proverbs 31 is oftentimes read on Mother's Day. It's it's the Proverbs 31 woman passage. And, and And I've heard tell of this, you know, that where people just, they struggle a little bit with this, with this description. I'm going to read for you in a minute because a lot of times it's read to inspire women, uh, but most of the time it just guilts them and shames them and, and, and all that. It's, it's just one of those, it should shame men, to be honest with you. I'm going to read it in just a minute. But Proverbs 31 is one of those books. And I asked the ladies um, about that, about this particular passage. I want to read it for you quickly before I show you the video. I want you to just think about this as like a resume. Okay. Talking about the things that you do versus the thing that she does. It says, who can find a, this is Proverbs 31, 10, says, who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her 
and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before the dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for the servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it, and with her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linens and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where, she, where she, he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise. She gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord is greatly praised. Reward her for all she's done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Talk about doing what you do, right? I mean, what have you done this morning? Nothing in comparison to that, right? You barely got up. You barely made the second service. Let's be honest. And I asked the ladies, I said, Did you, do you find the Proverbs 31 woman intimidating in terms of what she does? Because this is about placing value on what we do and on what we do. And then and if, they, if they had a thought, what was it that they felt like she valued or, or found value in? Let's listen real quick. I've never felt her intimidating. Okay. Um, to be like her, I want to be. Mm. But when thinking about what does she value out of all that she does, it has to be her walk with God. Mm. Because what woman can do all that? I mean, who can have, you know, clothes for their kids and, you know, in the waking hours at night and in the morning be up and, and taking care of everything? And I mean, I think that, I think it's the verse 30 where it talks about a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I think she could not be that woman if she didn't solely depend on God and trust in God. I never saw the Proverbs 31 woman as intimidating. I always saw her as, you know, courageous and bold. The Proverbs 31 woman is given her reward. She also was proud of herself, mm. you know, at the city gates because I think for so long um, I can say that you know, I felt like I made, you know, my family proud at the city gates. I made my children proud. But that, you know, at the end of the day, we, there's also a reward. When I lay down, I do feel like, you know, that's the reward because that's my desire every day is to, to give my best. She cooks, she cleans, she sews, she works out of the house, she works in the house. She's everywhere. She's up before everyone. She's up after everyone. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm gonna be real. She's scary. She doesn't do it by herself. She has servants. She has her family right there with her. She has God at her back. And that's the reminder I have to get out of it all the time is that it's okay to just throw it in the air and be like, God, this is yours. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna get all this done on me. So I got, I have to turn it over to him. Um, you know, and it doesn't say she got it all done in one day either. The Proverbs 31 woman is on one hand incredibly challenging, but on the other hand, I think she's really encouraging. And I'll say encouraging in the sense, I'll start there, in that she is, um, the way she's described, is she's a woman who is so diverse in what she's able to do. A woman who is um, valued by God can have a wide variety of skills that she brings to the table. And I think that, I mean, that's, I think that's really encouraging. I've heard the word valor described or the valor used in describing the, the woman, the Proverbs 31 woman. And I think that, I think that resonates with me that she's a woman of valor, that she is really pursuing God and pursuing the support of her family and that she's coming around her family and doing what needs to be done. So I used to think that the Proverbs 31 woman was intimidating. I researched because that's who I am and I read as much as I could about her and about that, um, that proverb. So I found that it was not intimidating at all. 
it was a poem written um, by her husband for her, commending her on um, on being being a wife, being a great wife, and being the mother of, of his children. And that struck a chord with me because all of a sudden I realized she's not perfect. And it doesn't say anywhere in there uh -huh. that she's not crazy stressed out doing all of those right. things. Exactly. <laughs> but, but, but he's saying, but he's going to leave those things out, right? He's going to say, this is my awesome, wonderful wife. These are all the thousands of things that she does to support me and my family. And above all, she shows us how to love God, and she shows us how to always go back to that. Um, and so from that moment forward, I kind of realized I don't have to be scared of her. I can, I can use her as, um, as a fuel to, to be better. And there are some areas that I can work on and, and be, continue to be better for my husband, be better for my kids, and, um, and, and take that approach. I think one of my favorite statements I wrote down uh, when I was listening was the fact that, that in all that this woman did, um, there was first and foremost this relationship with Christ, this relationship with God. And, and, and then she really meeting him in the midst of that is, is, this is where this diversity comes from. This is where the joy comes from for her to be able to accomplish those things. And I, as we talked with those ladies, I just said, you know, I just sense an overwhelming sense that, that when, when they have remembered, when they have remembered why God has called them to do the things they do, whether it's working and being a mom and all the things that are on their plate, when they remember that calling, when they remember to find that, that really that satisfaction in that versus on some intangible thing, that that is when the greatest joy, the greatest fulfillment, the greatest satisfaction comes in their life. And uh, one, more, one more time, Solomon in, in the next chapter in Ecclesiastes 3, he, he, he approaches the same question that he said earlier, but he says something a little bit different. I want to kind of paint this different picture because he asked the same question. What do people really get for their hard work? And he remembered before, he's like, what do they get in this life right now? What do they really get? He says, I've seen the burden God has placed on all of us, meaning I've seen the, the burden that it is to work and the things that we're called to do. Yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole shape of God's work from beginning to end. He, Solomon's saying, look, there's something bigger that resides in here. There's something more that, that we feel in our hearts that we're called to do or that we want to connect with in terms of what we're doing, but we can't see it. We don't have the scope and the vision that God has. So it's only in our trust in him, it's only in understanding the, that he wants to bring value in our work, not necessarily on it. He wants to bring value to us in what we're called to do so we can find our satisfaction in him. We're not going to see everything. We're not going to see how it connects the dots fully. Because we can only have the scope. And he follows it up by saying this. I concluded again, there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. Listen, this is the verse that people have tattooed on their chest that says e eat and drink and, you know, party. You know what I'm trying to say? And I could take that verse and party for the rest of my life, really. You could just take that verse right out of context. But reading it in the context of what we see, I concluded there's nothing better to be happy and enjoy life as long as we can. As people, we should eat and drink and what? Enjoy the fruits of labor. These are gifts from God. That our enjoyment, our satisfaction, our fullness in the value of us and everything that we do comes as a gift from God. It comes as a gift to our hearts that we can find value in our work, not on a position, a title, a, a, a role, but in the everyday in the working, in what we're called to do, whether you're changing diapers or changing contracts, and that was a weird analogy, but that's just what I think. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're called to find that satisfaction in him through your work. You can't see the full scope, but he can. So I asked the ladies one more time, and I was with the last video. I said, how do you sense that God shows you and shares value with you in your life in the everyday? Let's watch this real quick. My clients... You know, when they give me testimonies, it's so rewarding. Um, and I know that that's, yes, them saying thank you, but it's God saying, you're doing an awesome job in what you do. When my daughter, at two and a half, decided she wanted to start saying her own prayer, she didn't want to say the prayer that we always say at night. Nick and I are doing an awesome job, and God was saying, great job. When my husband rewards me and, and says thank you, or it, points out something totally off the wall 
that I've done to make him happy or proud. It, it's exciting, and I know that that's God saying um, that he values what I'm doing. I feel that God has given me opportunities to be able to work and be able to work in a way that works for our family. And I feel very convicted that I need to leverage those opportunities and that that is of value to him and enables me to obviously to do something that I enjoy doing, but I think it's enabling him to be glorified. It would be really nice if there was that explicit pat on the back, right? Like that would just make life so much easier. When he provides me those opportunities where I have that moment of clarity that that thing I did 10 years ago, that thing I did 20 years ago, that's come full circle. That now I get that glimpse. I get that glimpse of how that fit in his plan. Mm. If that's not intimate love and approval, what is? That God cared about me so much that he was paying attention to that random little thing that was in the grand scheme of what culture tells us is important, was no big deal. And he's brought that full circle and let me see that it was important. That is when I can just really bask in it and be like, okay, it all makes sense. I love to serve people. I mean, I really, to me, it's, it's uh, not only I'm passionate about it, it's also kind of like a stress reliever because I feel like in all areas of my life, um, that's what I'm doing. I do it at work, I do it at home with my kids, I do it when I volunteer at school. But the reward is, is that when you find out they're doing it even in school and it's not something that you know I've asked them to do. Um, so I love that. God shows me in real tangible ways that he values what I do. One day was not a very successful homeschooling <laughs> day, not one that you really want to write in the books. The next morning, my kids ran to the window where we had put a bird feeder. And they were just all about, oh, there were birds there, and we were trying to identify the birds. And I was just so thankful. I'm like, it matters, you know? Even when I screw up, they enjoy it. They're learning, they're experiencing life, and I get to be a part of that. Byron is very good about coming home or saying something. You know, we actually got to go to church yesterday as a family. and But he just commented. He just, you know, just nonchalantly just said, you know, you did school. You had breakfast. You had, you know, this. And, you know, I just, I felt appreciated. And I knew that was just God's way of just reaffirming that, you know, you matter. What you're doing is important. I know God is always showing me. I know he values me. He values what I do because um, I'm important to him. It's just seeing it and it's taking the time when he makes me feel comfortable when my life looks different than the other woman around me that lets me know that i'm valued i appreciate them so much just sharing with us and sharing with me that day just 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 the way in which they felt like god shared value with him and what i picked up on as a thread for most of them is that no matter whether they're serving or working or with as a mom or as they as they are in the course of doing their life, when God meets them, when, when, sort of the, when, when it intersects, so to speak, when God meets them, what the byproduct is, the product of them beginning to experience that fullness of what God sees with the limited view of what I see and begin to have the right measuring stick of the value of my work, the byproduct of it is joy. The byproduct of it is that we enjoy what we do. Because how we do what we do matters. And that's something that our world needs to see. Listen, the friends at your work and the friends in your neighborhood, the people that you connect with, they don't need to honestly hear every single spiritual moment that you have. They don't. They don't need to hear how you're trying to, just so that you can place value on your job, spiritualize it for them. They just need to see you enjoying life and enjoying your work and enjoying what God's called you to do right now. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom for this season. That's the greatest thing you can do. And if you go to work, that's the greatest thing you can do because God's calling you to it. We, my wife and I, have struggled with this in the early years of our kids. Just, you know, p people placing value on things. People placing value on working or being at home or on homeschooling or putting them in school. Like people placing all these values on things when the value is not found there. The value is found in the midst of what we're doing and called to do. That ultimately is where... God begins to take that eternal perspective, that perspective that only he can see. We're stuck, if we're not careful, we're stuck with pain and grief. 
And we don't understand what we're doing and the value of it. Or we can understand, as Solomon did, yeah, we can't see the whole scope, but it is such a gift from God to be in this moment and find satisfaction in what he's called me to do, to find satisfaction in my work. That's why how we do what we do matters. Because people don't want to hear about your amazing relationship with God when you hate your life and you hate your job and you just struggle and eke by when what he's called you to is experience incredible joy joy in the midst I love this book it's called Wild at Heart John Eldridge wrote it for for men if you're a man I've never read read that book I would encourage you to read it this year Wild at Heart it's a great book if you're a mother of a boy please read that book as well okay One of the things he states in that book that I have always loved, and it's kind of a common phrase, but but the question comes in in such a unique way. It says, you need to stop asking yourself what the world needs and ask yourself what makes you come alive. You need to stop being so concerned about what your clients expect and what people around you expect of you and where the the measuring stick of value is in terms of, well, you should be the boss by now or you should be running this department by now. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. What brings life and joy to you? And it says, when it follows the quote, it says, because what the world really needs is men and women who are living lives fully alive. Okay, you know what your work needs? They need you living a life where you are finding joy in your work because of Christ. That's what they need to see. That brings quality and character to your work and value. Knowing the value comes from God and the gift that it is to you. That's what other moms need to see in your life. They don't need to hear about this greatest thing, that the value placed on motherhood. They need to see the value of what it is like to be a mom in motherhood. That it's all about serving. It's all about stewarding the resources that you've been given for a very small period of time. Listen, if you like, if you like being a doctor and you like being in charge, find the joy in that and express it the best way you can. But if you like cleaning windows and you like, you know, middle management and looking at numbers all day, you're weird to me, but if you like that, do that. Do that with, do that with the joy that God wants you to have because that is valuable. All work is valuable, but the value that you'll find is in your work as God expresses his his heart through yours. Do that. Don't let anybody else place value on you or on the position or on a role or on a title. So the question I would ask today is, are you experiencing that kind of joy? Are you enjoying your work? Are you enjoying what you do? Because how you do what you do does matter. Are you enjoying it? And if you're not, then just think about these two things. Think about whether there has been value placed on something in your life that you're using the wrong measuring stick. Think about that in that terms of just maybe you're, a, you're thinking that it's all about the end of the race. And I'll be honest with you, if you're running, you better find the joy in running. Because you don't know how the race is going to turn out. Don't let people put value on the job, title, or position. Don't let your pride get in the way when you're working and doing something God's very, calm, very much placed you in the position you're in. And it may not be the thing, you may think it's beneath you. But if God's called you to it, then do it with joy. Find the joy in your work. Or maybe, just maybe, you're struggling to see value in what you do because you've lost the eternal significance. You've lost the fact, you think that for some reason there's got to be some moment where someone comes to Christ or you're changing a life because of this report that you just wrote. And the life that you need to be worried about changing is the joy that you find in writing that report because the people are looking at you all around you if you claim to be a follower of Christ. The only life you might change is after your 8900th report that you wrote and you've delivered with joy. Someone might actually look at you and say, it is such a pleasure to work with someone who finds value in their work. And then you have an opportunity to say, I find value in my work because I know who I'm working for. I know who I'm giving it all for, and right now he's called me to do this, and I, I find incredible joy and satisfaction in what I'm doing right now. And maybe you're struggling because you're not enjoying your work right now, but maybe you're struggling because you did it one time, enjoy it. And one time in your life, man, it was just 
it was the engine was purring and everything was connecting and you might not have even known how to describe it. You may not have even been Solomon to be able to describe that you understood that that was a gift from God. You understood that your satisfaction was being found in the work you're doing, not on it, it's not on the position or title. But you, because you chased a dream or because you shifted something, you've lost it. Now, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want anybody to quit work tomorrow, okay? Just don't, don't, don't do anything rash. Take all of this to God and say, God, I want your passion and purpose to live through me as I enjoy the work that you've called me to do, whether that's being a stay-at-home mom, an entrepreneur mom, a, a CEO, a boss, a stay-at-home dad. It doesn't matter. God, live your passion and purpose through me. Let me find the value that you've placed in my work. And may you begin to connect the dots for me so that one day I will see, one day I'll see it in full, even though I don't see it right now, that my value is only you. And as Paul said, if you're working at it with all your heart, you know where our reward comes from. You know where the inheritance is going to come from, and that is from Christ, the one you're serving. How we do what we do matters. We're called to enjoy what we do. They pray for us. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the mothers in the room. I thank you for what you've called them to. I thank you for the fact that, that there's no greater call, God, really, than a life surrendered to you and whatever path that looks like for us. And so for all of us, God, it changes. And you're in the midst of every one of those changes. And so, God, may we, may we find joy in our work because of you. May we recognize that it's a gift from you. May we recognize that it is that you are the one who pours out the ability to enjoy the fruit of our labor. God, may no one else in our life, may the culture, may our bosses, may well-intended Christians, God, may they never be able to place on us the value on things that we should be doing. But God, may we just strive to find the value in where we are because of you, because we're working for you. We are doing it all for you. God, we thank you for your word and the way it challenges our hearts. And as we wrestle with the question today as to whether or not right now we're really enjoying what we're doing, God, would you just pour through your spirit answers to us, answers to our soul? We trust you and you alone for it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed engaging in our worship experience. Everything we do at Journey is to help make a difference in people's lives. If God has been moving and working in your life, we would love to hear your story. You can share it with us at mystory@thejourneyonline.com. If you would like to invest in the ministry and mission at Journey Church, you can give online at thejourneyonline.com. Thank you for investing in the lives that are changing at Journey Church.